So today we are in week five of our series on the kingdom of God. Um, and I want us this morning to think briefly, we're going to talk about our role in the kingdom, but really as we see what our role in the kingdom primarily is, um, really how do we go about fulfilling that role that God has called us as followers of Jesus Christ? How do we, how do we live that out? How do we flesh it out in our daily lives? And so we're going to talk about our role. We'll also talk a little bit about well, th three of the points this morning really talk about the same thing from three different, it's really looking at the same thing from three different perspectives uh, and how God's Word sort of lays it out. And it's really talking about the Spirit-filled life. H how do we live out what we say we believe? How do we live a life that is abundant? Because I think too often in the Church of America today anyway, we tend to think of, of Christianity and we talk about kingdom being kingdom-minded as thinking about what's going to happen on the other side of the Jordan, right? And I'm not talking about the Jordan that flows through Israel. I'm talking about on the other side of the grave. We think about what's going to happen on the other side of the grave, and yet Jesus told us in John 10.10, 10, I have come that you may have life and you may have it abundantly. And so it's not just on the other side of the grave, but how do we live out the Christian life abundantly here in this life today as we prepare for the life which is to come because that's really what's important isn't it i mean i don't i don't, I don't think you see anywhere in scripture where god intended for us just to go through life going i oh i oh it's off to work i go right uh, that's not how life should be lived that we ought to live life in a way that life should be enjoyable it ought to be something that makes us every morning want to get up out of bed instead of stay in bed and pull the covers over our head and if we're honest we all go through those mornings right i'm not the only one right um some of those mornings we just want to cover our heads up and just stay there and we think well if i if i if i just stay in the bed then it'll get better or we think well i got up on the right side maybe if i get back in i get out of the left side the day will start going better and that's really, life should be much more than just going through the motions. And so I want us to think about that a little bit today. As the Apostle Paul addresses a church, as he writes to the church in Corinth, it's a church that was in, the, it was in the midst, it was in a city that was given to the worship of idols to false gods. Now, everywhere you turn, there were these huge, magnificent uh, temples built to all these different gods in the midst of this place of, of hedonism that or heathenism, either however you want to say it, that God placed his church there in the midst of this difficult place. And Paul is re reminding them that he's reminding them, first of all, of who they are and the role that they have in the kingdom of God. And we're just going to look at one little section in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 through verse 18, and then we're sort of going to depart a little bit from that. We're, we're doing a more of a topical type, service, uh, to topical type sermon and so um, we will jump around quite a bit. And so we're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll begin in verse 16, uh, and we'll actually start in the second sentence of verse 16. But the Apostle Paul says, he says, For we are the temple of the living God. W what is important about that? That we are the temple of the living God. Again, think about the context in which the church, this church is found, the church in Corinth. I said it's a pagan city, right? That's full of all kind of temples, all kind of idols to false gods or gods that are made by human hands that are the creation of a human mind. And so in the midst of that, Paul says, but you are the temple of the living God. In contrast to the dead gods, that you are the temple of the living God. And then he goes back and quotes three, two or three different passages out of the Old Testament. He sort of combines a couple of passages together uh, in, this, in verse 16 and 17 and 18. But he says, as God said... I will dwell and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the apostle Paul reminds the believers in Corinth that they are to have nothing to do with lawlessness. And he said, talks about that you are no longer in the dark, but now you are to be messengers who are walking and living in the light, and you are no longer to be controlled by the idols of this world because you are the temple of the living God. We've talked about this quite a bit over the last uh, four weeks or so, actually I guess five weeks since last week we had our Me Mexico mission report. But as we think about being temples, the, a temple of the living God, that God has said, all the way, you can go all the way back through Scripture in the Old Testament, that God continually tells His people that He's going to come and tabernacle among them. He's going to come and dwell among them. We go back to the garden, God's original intent. We're told that, that during the cool of the day that God would come in the garden and He would walk with Adam and Eve. 
what is the significance that he walked with them? What do you do when you're walking with somebody, hopefully? I mean, today you probably got a, you know, some wireless headphones on and you're not talking to the other person, but ideally when you're walking with somebody that you're living life with them and you're sharing life with them, you're experiencing the fellowship with them. And so the idea is that God would come and fellowship with Adam and Eve throughout the day. But then when sin entered into the world, that relationship was jacked up, right? That God separated. He kicked them out of the garden. They were removed from the garden. And because of sin, death entered into the world. And with death, we had disease. We had where work from, went from being fun to do. It went to being hard to do. Uh, and so there's all these struggles that go on. But God is continually fulfilling his promises. We know ultimately it was fulfilled in Jesus. But we see it in the tabernacle where where God, where as they're traveling through the wilderness, that God created this place of worship, a tabernacle where God's glory came upon it. It was a physical representation of God's presence among the people as they traveled around in the wilderness. And that even as they arrived in the promised land after, after 40 years, they still have the tabernacle until after David dies and his son Solomon builds the temple. And again, God's glory comes upon the temple. It's a physical representation of God's presence, that God had came and tabernacle, that God had come to live in their midst. And then Jesus is the ultimate tabernacle of God, right? In John chapter 1, it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Jesus came and tabernacled among mankind, and we know that ultimately that he will be that temple that we will dwell with for eternity. But then when Jesus returned to heaven, he sent us a comforter, right? Who is the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit, we're told in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and dwelt among the believers, right? Not among, but he dwelt in the believers. He took up residence in them, and then we become the temple of the living God. In the past, people had to come to the temple to worship, but now the temple is to go out to where the people are at. In verses 17 and verse 18, Paul begins to call the church, because we are the temple of the living God, that he is calling us to live holy lives. Look with me quickly at verse 17 and verse 18. He says, Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch any unclean thing, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my son, be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And so the disciples of Jesus, Paul says that, he says that we're like the holiest of all buildings during the lifetime of Christ. Which would be what? What would be the holiest of all buildings? The temple, right? That the temple was that holy place that God dwelt. And so here, Paul is saying that like that holiest of all places, I mean, you think about that, that one day a year, the high priest could enter into the most holy of places and make a sacrifice for the sins of the people, right? What happened if he entered into that place with sin in his life? He would get dragged out by a rope, right? He had bales on his little garment, and he'd go in there, and God would kill him dead, and they'd have to drag him out, right? So there's an aspect of holiness. And so as we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, Paul says that we also are to be holy. But is that concept just an Old Testament thing? I would say that it is not. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and verse 16, the apostle Peter also says, But as the one who called you is holy... You also are to be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Because God is holy and we are his representatives, we also are to be holy. And as a place where God's spirit dwells, we are to seek to live holy lives that glorify, that honor, that lift up God as the God of all gods. It's not because we lose our salvation when we sin. It's because we disqualify ourselves from being useful right? When we're living in open rebellion against God as his children, then we are not useful. We are that unuseful pot. It's, it's sort of like, you know, sometimes you see these kids do the cooking, and when they get through with the, um, the, the we call those, those noodles with the cheese in them. What do we call that? Macaroni. macaroni. Yeah, my wife's on this keto diet, so I don't get macaroni and cheese anymore. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, but have you ever seen that thing after it sat for three or four days to try to scrape all those noodles and the cheese out of there? Yeah, it's, not, it's not useful until you clean it up, right? Whenever we, when we have unconfessed sin in our life, we're like that nasty pot that nobody... I mean, would you, would you pour a can of soup in that? I wouldn't and eat after it. Some of you may would do that, but I will not. 
And so as the place where God's Spirit dwells, we are to seek to live holy life so that we can be useful to God. I, I want to quickly look at, I keep saying quickly, and I don't know that I do anything quick other than talk fast. Um, but uh, I, I want us to think about this idea of being a temple of the Holy Spirit because that is our role, right? Our role, our primary role is to be a temple of the Holy Spirit that as a follower of Jesus Christ, God's Spirit lives in us. And as we go into, a, into this world, because we're, Jesus said, if I wanted you to be out of the world, I'd have took you out. But I didn't take you out. I left you in it. You're not to be of the world, but you're going to be in the world, right? And so we're in the world in which we live, but as we go, we are to reflect His glory. We're to reflect who He is to a world that desperately needs to have a relationship with God. And so I want us to look at four truths about being or fulfilling that role of being a temple of the Holy Spirit. The first thing, and I've already made reference to this, is that cleanliness precedes usefulness. Cleanliness precedes usefulness. I, I, I'm starting this morning with, a, with, with an understanding that I hope this is to be true of all of us. But I believe that, that all, every one of us desires to, to, li, to be living our lives as followers of Christ where when God speaks that we can hear his voice. Because the Bible also says that we face an enemy that also speaks into our mind as well. And so we want to be so in tune with God and walking with him that when the enemy comes and says into your life or into my life, you have no value. God can't use somebody like you. You don't really have any real talents. I'm not even sure you have any spiritual gifts. The preacher says all of us have spiritual gifts, but I'm not so sure about you. And you begin to question and doubt everything there is about yourself. That is not God speaking. That is the enemy speaking. And we want to be so in tune, I, I, I believe that all of us would like to be so in tune with God that we clearly hear His voice and we know that it is He that is speaking. That we want to be led by the Spirit of God. We want the Spirit of God to guide and lead us each day. And that we want to live in fellowship with God. We want to commune with God. We want to have fellowship with God. We want to be intimate with God. We want to know everything about Him. We want Him to know us as well and to walk with Him in fellowship. And I think that all of us would agree that we also want to do great things for God as well. I, I don't know about you, but, you know, as a, especially as a young guy, a young preacher boy, years, days, you know, a long time ago, the, the idea of coming to the end of my life and, and looking back and to see that I had done nothing for God was something that terrified me. And it, it still drives me and motivates me some. To, to not accomplish anything in my life would be, uh, to me, to finish the end of the, to finish my race and actually not really finish it, just sort of coast through it would be something that would really be horrible. I really want to live my life in a way that I hear my father one day say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little thing, so here, come and rule over many things. That's the desire, and I hope that is your desire. I'm assuming that that is your desire here today. But what is it that keeps us from accomplishing our heart's desire or even God's desire for us? Look at what the Apostle Paul writes as he writes to his young son in the faith, uh, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and verse 21. He says, Now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also those of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. So if anyone purifies himself from anything dishonorable, he will be a special instrument set apart, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. The illustration that Paul uses as he speaks to his young son of the faith is he looks at the, these big fancy houses in Rome or in these major cities, and he says, look at these cities. They have all kinds of instruments in these homes. Some of them are made out of gold and silver, and some are made out of very common things like wood and clay. He says some things are, are useful for honorable things and some for, are used for dishonorable things. But he says that we should seek to live life in a way that our lives do honorable and not dishonorable things. So to sort of go back and look at Paul's illustration, the large house in his metaphor is the church, right? It is the church. That, that is the large house. And some of the articles in the house are expensive. Some are gold and silver and others are inexpensive like wood and clay. Some are used for important occasions and some are used for ordinary purposes. And the point that Paul is making here is he writes to his young son in the faith, and as he writes to us even in this day, is he thinks about the church, is that the church is full of both faithful and unfaithful believers. He's talking about believers here, There's, that some are faithful and some are unfaithful. In verse 21, Paul says that we are to purify 
ourselves. How do we purify ourselves? I mean, we think about the context of a pot. How does a pot clean itself? I mean, it, it can't wash itself off and then put itself in a dishwasher, right? Or wash it by hand in the sink. It can't do it on its own. It's dependent upon someone to, to influence it. But here, Paul says that we are to purify ourselves. So how do we do that? How we do that is that we confess our, we confess our sin and we turn from our sin. In other words, it's, it's not just feeling sorry for your sin, right? I mean, I, mean, I, could, I, could, I, I can be, I can't, I'm trying to think of a nice word. I, I can be a real jerk at times, you know. And there's times that I, I say things that, that um, are not always nice to my wife when I'm angry, okay? There's times that, I mean, I'll be honest and transparent. There's times, I mean, she would agree. There's times that, that I'm not kind with my words, um, and I could say, oh, baby, I'm so sorry that I said that. I should have never said that. And then if the next moment, the next word out of my mouth is, Bleh, you know, did I, did I really, did I, was there, did I just feel sorry that I said something or was there really a life change, right? That true confession should lead to repentance. And repentance is a turn, it's a turn from, that I'm going one direction and I turn away from that. That there's a life change in my, in my life, right? That I've changed, that I don't just feel sorry for my sin, and then just keep going right along. That, that there is a change in my life that we confess and we turn away from our sins. And that is a difference between being a faithful and an unfaithful Christian. Because the reality is that we all sin, right? I mean, I, I do. I've already sort of confessed one of mine, that sometimes I have, I have a mouth that needs to be quiet and sometimes it doesn't stop talking. That... that that we all struggle with sin. We all struggle with our humanity, or as the Bible says, we all struggle with our flesh. The faithful Christian recognizes their weakness, and they lean upon Jesus. I mean, because honest, I, I, I say early in my Christian life, but I still struggle with this sometimes, that, that I want to make the change in myself. I can defeat this sin in my life. I can defeat this struggle. And what happens when I try to defeat that struggle? I fall right back into it, right? Because my, my flesh is constantly pulling me toward the sin. It's, it's pulling me toward rebellion against God. And there's this war going on. Paul describes in the book of Romans. There's this war that's constantly going on inside of me to do the right thing or to do the wrong thing. Now, I don't have two little angels, one or a demon and an angel on my shoulder telling me one with the other. It's, in, it's inside. It's that flesh inside of me where I'm struggling to do the things that are right. And the difference between a faithful Christian and an unfaithful Christian, an unfaithful Christian says, I got this. I can turn over a new leaf. I can, do, I can make this change. Or an unfaithful Christian is the one that says, I really don't want to change. And I'm in full-blown rebellion mode. And I become stiff neck, and I'm going to do it my way. That's unfaithful. A faithful Christian still struggles with sin. We still sin. We still fall short. The difference is, is that we go running back to God and say, God, I, I've tried. I've tried real hard. And the harder I try, the more mistakes I seem to make. God, if you don't bring about a change in me, it will never happen. It's whenever we begin to understand how weak and how sinful we really are that we begin to turn it over to God and allow God to begin to change us from the inside out. But if we confess and turn from our sin, Paul says here in the illustration he uses that, first of all, that God will make us holy, that he will set us apart for God's special purposes. He also says that we will be useful to our master. That when we, re when we confess and we repent or we confess and we turn from our sin, that we are useful to our, to our master. He also says that we are ready, that we are prepared to undertake whatever it is that the Lord calls us to do. It sort of reminds me of the parable that we talked about several weeks ago about the, the ten bridemaids, that five of them were prepared. They had, their, they had the oil in their lamp and their wicks were trimmed, and when the groom showed up, they were ready to go. They were prepared and they were ready for what God had for them. But the other five, they just were sort of living life. And they thought, you know, hey, there's always time. I, got, I still got plenty of time. 
And unexpectedly, the groom shows up and their lamps are empty and they are unprepared for the work the master had for them to do. And the reality is that we need to be living in such a way that we're continually... Uh, Bill Bright used to refer to confession and repentance as like spiritual breathing, that, that, we are bre- that we breathe in the good things, we breathe in God's word, and that confession is like we're breathing out the bad things out of our body, that we're breathing out the bad things of our spirit, that we live in this constant state of taking in God's word and kicking out the sin in our life, that we're constantly confessing and repenting of our sins. And so the question for each of us is this, are, are we living a life separated from the world And are we in right standing before God? As believers, are we living a life that is separated from the world? And I don't mean that we go in some kind of, I already said that, that that we're not to be separate from the world and that that we are to separate ourselves from the world, but we're to be in the world but not like the world. Are you living the Christ life in the midst of the world that God has placed you? Are you in right standing before God? If God were to come right now, if God were to call you home right now, are you prepared? Or would you be saying, but God, but God, but God, give me, give me some more time. I, I'm, I'm really not ready. Let, let, Lord, let me, let, me, let me confess my sin. Let me, let me do some more things for you. Are we ready to meet him? That's the real issue. I, is there a consistent, persistent sin in your life? Say that three times real fast. Is there a consistent, persistent sin in your life that is unaddressed, that is unconfessed? Listen, don't let it fester. Because it can be like a little thorn. You, you can be out you know, riding a you know, four-wheel or some ATV and you run through a, a briar patch and you get a little bitty splinter or a little bitty uh, thorn in your finger and you ignore it. And if you're not careful, it can kill you. And sin is like that in our lives. It will suck the life out of us. And instead of living an abundant life, we will live a mundane. Even as believers, we will live a life that God has not created us for. God has created us to live abundantly and we will live a life of defeat listen that is if that's you today then i ask you i beg you i implore of you to seek god's face today to ask him to forgive your sin and to turn from it and to walk with the lord the second thing is we really start diving into what it means to be spirit filled is that we are to walk with christ and i want to be clear that here this morning that that i'm not saying that we earn or that we keep god's favor by doing good things we're not saved by good works, and we don't stay in God's favor by doing good works. Right? I mean, my kid could really mess up bad, and she would never cease being my kid. I could be very disappointed in her choices. Thankfully, right now, I'm pretty excited about most of her choices. Um, I mean, if she did everything exactly like I wanted, it'd be a lot better, but then, <laughs> then there would be no need for me because she would be, or no need for her one because we'd be just alike. We'd be like two little robots. I'm glad she's not like me. When God uses her, her, her in my life to stretch me and cause me to think through some things that I'm sort of stubborn. And sometimes I think I got it all figured out. And God's really used her to be that sounding board that really challenges my thought processes some. And so it's been good for me. Um, hopefully you have some people in your life that will challenge you and not just flow with you. Uh, but I'm not saying that we earn God's favor or that we keep God's favor by being good. The Bible says that our good deeds, and we try to do that, that our good deeds are as filthy rags before God. In our own strength, we are incapable of obeying the law. In our own strength, it is impossible for us to obey God completely, right? We don't keep the law to be saved. We are able to obey the, law, the Lord because we are saved. We have been saved to do good works. I'm not saved by my good works, but I am saved to do good works. So how can we walk with Christ? The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 5, 16, um, he says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, we're taught the law is unable to save us, that only faith in Jesus saves. But that doesn't mean that grace is opposed to effort. The Bible encourages us to walk alongside God in advancing his kingdom. And we could spend a lot of time here this morning. We're told to put off our old self. We're told to put on the new self in Ephesians 4. In 1 Timothy 4, we're told to train ourselves in godliness. In Hebrews 12, we are told to pursue peace with everyone. Those are all active words, right? We're to put off, put on, we're to train, we're to pursue. And so there's an aspect that grace doesn't 
take away our effort. We operate in the, in the grace of God, but that doesn't mean that we just sort of sit on the sidelines and just wait for God to ding, 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 and then we're all changed. But that God, it takes effort from us. And the point is this, that the strength, the strength for our working comes from outside ourselves, that the Holy Spirit and God work in us and, and through us, and it puts pressure from us from the outside and God provides the ability to accomplish the work he has called us to do. God has called us to a task. Ephesians chapter 2 very clearly says that we, have been crea- we, we were created, that we were saved to do good works, and that God equips us and prepares us, empowers us to walk with him and to carry on the work that he wants to do in and through us. The third thing is that we need to walk in the Spirit. It's impossible for us to live the Christian life in our own strength. I, I'm going to say this over and over throughout this message. It is only possible as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through our lives. And that requires that we yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That means that I've got to let go of control. And most of us like to be in control, don't we? Right? I mean, I know you ladies, you go to your husband with something, you just want to share your heart with him. And what is the first thing we start trying to do? We start trying to fix it, right? And you didn't ask our opinion on how to fix it. You already know what you need to do to fix it. You just want us to listen to what's going on in your life. It's part of a relationship, but we want to fix it. We want to solve it, you know. Let me call that boss yours. I got something I had to tell that boss, you know. Um, we We want to have our hand, and there's a part that we've got to yield to the Holy Spirit that we have to really let go. And I don't like all those little cliches, let go and let God, but... There is an aspect that we have to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit's work and movement in our life. That we have to obey Him. Maybe that's a better word. Yield sort of has a stop sign kind of. Not really, I guess for me it doesn't really stop. I'm sort of going quickly as I can through the yield. But, um, but there's an aspect that, that yielding is obeying. As the Holy Spirit convicts and prompts and moves in our life, that we simply obey Him. In Paul's personal mission statement that we see in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 through verse 29, Paul writes about the Holy Spirit working in him to accomplish God's plan. It says, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of his mystery, which is in you, the hope of glory. And so God's purpose for Paul's life is that he might proclaim the hope of glory. He says, we proclaim him warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. The key verse, verse 29 He said, I labor for this. That's sweat equity, right? I labor, I'm involved. But he says, I'm striving with not my strength, but I'm striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. It sort of appears here that Paul is using his own strength, but when you really look at the text, what you see is that Paul is completely and totally dependent upon the power and the work of God's Spirit working in him to do the work. Listen, we don't have to work for our salvation. We work from our salvation. And as we see God's plan for our lives, our responsibility is to obey as we yield to the Holy Spirit. And as we do that, he accomplishes his work in us, which is transforming us, right, into the image of his Son. But not only is it doing transformation in us, but also God is working through us to bring about his work of grace and transformation in others, right? That the Holy Spirit is changing us. Is it not clear? Y'all looking at me sort of strange. The, the Holy Spirit works in us. That is transformation, right? We're not to be conformed to this world, Paul says in Romans 12, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Our minds are, are renewed by what? The Holy Spirit as he takes the word of God and transforms our mind into the mind of Christ. And as he begins to transform us, then we become his instrument to bring about transformation in others right? That God's Spirit uses us. The, the fourth thing, and all these, these, these three things are really tied in, but we're to walk after the Word. In Ephesians 5, verse 18 through verse 22, the Apostle Paul encourages believers to abstain from getting drunk with wine, but instead he tells them, he commands them to be filled or to be controlled by the Spirit. Like someone would be controlled by wine if they're drunk, instead we're to be controlled or filled by the Holy Spirit. The result is, Paul says, that they will speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making music with our heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything. But I want us to focus real quickly on Paul's, also his letter to the church in Colossus, 
Colossae, A, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 through verse 17, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The two phrases, to be filled with the Spirit or to let the Word of Christ dwell richly among you, are, are synonyms. They're synonymous. They're, they basically mean the same things. It's stated just in two different ways. Because in both passages, the result of whether it's being filled with the Spirit or letting the Word of Christ dwell richly in you, the result is the same. That there is a love for reading God's Word, for sharing the Word, for memorizing the Word, for meditating on the Word, for proclaiming the Word, for obeying the Word, for singing the Word, being thankful to God. It's all throughout that same, both those passages, we see that the result of God's Spirit working in us, whether it's being filled with the Spirit or whether it's being, uh, being, or dwelling richly on the Word of God, it brings about God changing us. And that is the result of a Spirit-filled life. When we are filled with the Spirit, the attention of our minds and the affection of our hearts will be on following the King and pleasing Him. Not out of compulsion, but out of worship. That we adore Him. We, we, um, we worship Him. We, we dwell upon Him. We think about Him. We acknowledge His greatness and His majesty. So what is the result of a Spirit-filled life? First of all, we make disciples. As we are walking in the Spirit, as God's Spirit is transforming and changing us, as we are in the Word, as we are spending time with the Lord, we will make disciples. Kingdom disciples are expected to make disciples. Jesus told his disciples in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, he says, follow me and I will make you fish for people. In the Great Commission, we are told to go and do what? Make disciples. That, that, that is the main verb, is to make disciples. Everything else flows out of that. When we, when we adopt a kingdom agenda, our, our focus shifts from a, really from a come and see model, even though there's nothing wrong with saying come and, come and see, because we see that in the, in the New Testament, right? Didn't Andrew do that with his brother? Come, come and see this man. Come, come and see this man. But our, our primary focus should not be come and see. Really, it should be to disciple and deploy, Right? I mean, think about how, I mean, best case, I mean, that's not about best case scenario. If you spend the maximum amount of, unless you work here, if you spend the maximum amount of time here, you may be here for th two or three hours in the morning, depends how long I preach, uh, going a little long today. Maybe three hours in the morning, if you come back on Sunday night, that's another hour, that's four hours. Um, if you come back on Wednesday night, it's another hour. So maybe five hours that you're really here on a weekly basis at most. Um, what about all the other hours? If it's just to come and see, and it's really not disciple and deploy, then are we really accomplishing what God has called us to do? We, we are to be a church that equips the saints and sends them out as kingdom agents into the world to make disciples. I don't know about you, I grew, I grew up as a kid that wanted to be like a CIA agent or to be a cowboy. Um, and then as an adult, I think about no air conditioning and riding a horse and sleeping out on the prairie during the summer this time of year. That doesn't sound like much fun at all. Um, with a bunch of stinky cowboys, that, yeah, that doesn't sound too good. Um, but, you know, you have all these ideas. But the reality is, as followers of Christ, every one of us is an agent of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we're not, we're not to be covert. You know, like we're in hiding. You know, we got our... Jesus bad somewhere on the inside, and then at the right moment, we convince somebody it's time to switch over to our side, right? But we are to be out making disciples. The, the second thing, the second result of the Spirit-filled life is that we share the gospel. In Romans 1, 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew and also to the Greek. If you read through the book of Acts, you see where the church started out adding their number, and then they moved to a place where they began to multiply in number. How did they accomplish this feat? Was it just through guys like Peter getting up and preaching before a big crowd and there were people being saved? That was part of it, but was that really all of it? The majority of that was not because it comes a point where it becomes illegal to be a Christian because you're considered to be either by the Jews, you were considered to be an atheist. By the Romans, you know, you, you were looked down upon too. They thought that when you 
did communion that you were really eating a, eating a body and drinking blood. And so they really had some weird ideas about that. And also you didn't swear allegiance to Caesar. And that also was looked down upon very highly. And so it wasn't necessarily through getting up and preaching in front of great crowds. It really was done about individual believers who live their lives on mission in their communities and in their workplaces. And so as a church, our goal is to develop believers who are maturing in their walk with Christ, who are equipped with confidence to live on mission in their workplace, in their neighborhoods, in their homes, and even in their communities. Listen, I hope that, that each of us will seek to be intentional about living out the gospel. I know a lot of you think, man, I, golly, you know, I, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to be one of those guys downtown holding a big sign preaching on a street corner somewhere. Or I'm not, I'm, you know, I just, I'm not going to be that guy that's knocking on somebody I don't know's door you know, to go through the Roman Road or EE or CWT or Faith Outline. Uh, that's not me. And so that God didn't call me to that. What about the people God puts in our sphere of influence? I mean, because honestly, I'm really more of an introvert. I mean, I'm around people I don't know. I'm usually sort of quiet um, until I get to know somebody and then I don't stop talking. Um, it's sort of who I am. And so, you know, when I knock on a door, I know I'm the preacher man, but when I knock on doors, I don't know. Sometimes I'm praying they're not home. Um, you know, I'm just being honest. It's some of that. I, that's not. It's not something I look forward to, even though sometimes that's what God calls us to do. But just think what what would happen if every one of us just lived on mission in our workplaces, or just lived on mission with our families, our extended families, or our friends, or the you know, some of you just got kids that are in ball. What if we lived on mission with our ball teams? That, that if we lived in a way that we understood that even when we're talking to our Little League baseball team, that, that we are to be missionaries in that environment. That's not asking you to go knock on somebody's door you don't know or to share Christ with somebody you don't know. Just living in the context. That's what the early church did because it was illegal to them to, to be open about a lot of things. Instead, they just sought to live their lives for God in such a way that they saw other people not as a project that they could fix, but instead they saw them as their friends. And how about you? But if, you, if somebody's really a friend, they love you and they care for you regardless, right? And they want what's best for you. It's, not, it's seeing someone not as a project, but seeing them as a friend. And then as you live out your Christian life before them, when opportunities arise... And if you're really friends with someone, those opportunities will arise. Eventually, they'll go through something difficult, or you'll go through something difficult. And they'll be saying, man, I don't, I don't know how you have the strength to go through this. And when you say, man, I don't have the strength to go through this. I've not bought in the lie that says, God won't put anything on me bigger than what I can handle. Fooey on that. God never says he'll put anything on us less than we can handle. What he said is that he'll be with there, there with us and that he will give us the strength. And so from the life, from life, we're able to share the story of how God is working in our life. How God is working in us as one friend to another, not as a friend to a project, but as a friend to a friend, we share about how God has changed and worked in our lives. And then we can share our story. The, the third thing, and I, I'm trying to, to speed up a little bit, but the third thing is, or the third result is the kingdom expands. And I'll be honest, the more I studied this, the, for this sermon this morning, this, this last point really took a totally different direction than what I originally had thought. I think about the kingdom expanding. I think of, I think of Pentecost. Boom, 3,000 people, you know, blow it up. That's sort of what goes through my mind. But in reality, we think about the kingdom expanding. It begins in me, and it begins in you, and then it goes from there outward. And the call to, to follow Christ is not a call to an amusement ride or to go to Six Flags ride. It's a call to be living for the king, to be co-laborers in his mission. And as we're doing those things, God's kingdom expands. But I want us to think a little bit about that, that expansion and what it looks like. When Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, he, re, he compared it to a mustard seed. And he says in, in Matthew 13, verse 31 and 32, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when grown, it is taller than the garden plants and becomes a tree. So the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. 
In, in Palestine, the mustard seed during the time of Christ was the smallest of all seeds. And yet it was a plant that would grow to between 12 and 15 feet tall. It's a little bit different than the mustard seeds that we might have here in the United States. In Palestine, during the time of Christ, they would grow to 12 to 15 feet tall. And the point of the parable is the kingdom of God is like that little bitty mustard seed that is small and seems to be insignificant. And yet, as it begins to grow, it starts out small and it grows and it grows and grows and becomes a mighty little plant or a mighty plant 12 to 15 feet tall. In the same way, the church is, is that same way. In, in the beginning, that it was, it was just a small group that Jesus had, right? And by the time, by the time of, of the resurrection, they were, we're told there were 120 followers of Christ, and they were all there in Jerusalem. On the day of Pentecost, they began to, well, they're praying up to it. I think it was 10 days they began to pray that the Holy Spirit would come. Holy Spirit comes. Peter stands up and preach. 3,000 are added to the kingdom that day. Continue to read the book of Acts. Eventually we see where it's, the numbers are being added to daily, and then finally we see where it begins to multiply. But even with 3,000 believers, you think about the church, the church. When you think about even during the time of Christ, the, I don't know how many would have been alive during that time, 7 million people. Still was still a very small number. And yet the growth continues on. Listen, as we consider growth whether it's our own personal spiritual growth or it's the growth of god's church in particular a local church god doesn't rush his work god allows trials and troubles in our lives as believers to conform and i think even as a church to conform and mold us in the image of his son and we know from romans chapter 8 that god never wastes a hurt in our life right that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, that God takes everything in our life and uses them for his glory. There are times that the kingdom of God, as we think the church, and we think impacting the world, the kingdom of God, there are times that it grows quickly, but most of the time it grows slowly. Because oftentimes slow growth is healthier than fast growth, Right? Sometimes kingdom growth is even undetected. We don't even see what God is doing because we tend to live with tunnel vision. I think about a missionary named Adoniram Judson. At the age of 24, God called him to Burma, and God filled him with a passion to see people come to faith in him. And throughout his years, his 38 years there, his conviction will be put to the test. He buried two wives in Burma. Seven of his 13 children died during his ministry there in Burma. He faced constant persecution and imprisonment. And I don't mean just was put in some little jail. He was in prison where he was tortured for his faith. During that time of imprisonment, he wrote the Burmese English Dictionary and a grammar for Burmese English. He also translated the New Testament into Burmese. After 10 years in his ministry, there was one church with 18 believers. And if you go on and read his story, God used him to have great impact even after his death there in Burma. But think about it. If you plugged and you worked at whatever your job is, in 10 years you see little growth, but you don't see what God is doing behind the scenes. And whether it's our personal life or even, even if it's the life of the local church, we have to develop a long view of life instead of a microwave view. I'll be honest, I like the microwave view. My wife's going to training this week, and I went and bought all kind of microwave stuff. And it took forever because I was, I was trying to look at the carbs, and oh my gosh, one thing had like 70 carbs in it. I thought, goodness gracious. And then I thought, cook a meal, microwave. Okay, 70 carbs isn't very bad. Um... <laughs> And so I think a lot of times we, th we see in our personal life our, sp our personal spiritual growth. We want the Superman booth, right? We want to jump into the booth, spin around, and come out as super Christian. And yet the Christian walk is slow and it's tedious and sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes... It's not, it's not an emotional high. Sometimes it's doing the right thing even when we don't feel like doing the right thing. 
Sometimes it's just plugging away, believing that God is going to do his promises, even when it doesn't seem that way. We think about all the promises in the, in the Old Testament. And there were 400 years, Jesus goes quiet. I mean, the Holy Spirit goes quiet. There is no speaking from God for 400 years until the New Testament begins. And yet God was always at work preparing everything for the exact moment in history when he was going to send his Messiah. And we could go through all that. The Roman road, a common language, all the different things that God was setting into place to impact the world with the gospel. We must take a long view. It doesn't mean that we, that we make excuses for things. We should never do that. We ought to be doing the best we can. But ultimately, we have to trust God to do his part. But listen, let us never under, underestimate what God can do in a short period or what he can do over a long haul. Because there are times that God just shows up in, in our personal life and even in a church life where I mean, all of a sudden we go, boom, I mean, goodness gracious, where did all this happen? I mean, I pastored a church one time that we had basically no young adults. And it was the craziest thing ever. We had like six young couples visit the same Sunday. They all had little kids. They were all about the same age. They come to Sunday school and they think, oh, this is a great church. They got kids my kid's age. They all started coming. If they would have come individually, they never would have come to our church. It just what happened, God ordained everything where we had an immediate growth of six families with little ones. And so God can do what he wants to do. But we, and we have to be faithful. We have to be doing our part. But when even when things don't seem to be happening the way we think they ought to happen, we have to keep trusting and we have to keep believing and we have to keep working, right? We have to keep doing what God has called us to do. Listen, the key to living the Christian life is enjoying the abundant, victorious life that Jesus has for us. Instead of beating ourselves up all the time, I think too many of us walk around like those monks that hid out in the caves and we spend all of our time chink, 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 and life is just a bore. And it ought to be fun. We ought to enjoy life. We ought to, we ought to be the happiest of everybody, right? We ought not look like we've been sucking on a pickle. Right? Um, I see some of you that have natural smiles, and I'll be honest, I'm envious. Because they have like a natural frown. I mean, you have to really work to smile. Um, and usually I point it out, I'll be like, man, I love your beautiful smile. I wish I had that. Um, but we ought to be happy. There ought to be an excitement. It shouldn't be mundane. And even in ministry at times, we get caught up in so many of the nuances of things that we lose sight of the fact that the Christian life is about knowing Him. That's the main thing. We know Him. The other part begins to flow out of that. If we're walking with Him, then the natural outflow of that is that we're going to be making disciples. We're going to be sharing our faith. We're going to be growing individually, spiritually, but also we'll be growing as a church if we're walking with God and we're doing what we're called to do as we close the morning i'm sorry that i've gone so long i really want you to think about this morning about your relationship with christ one do you have a relationship with him do you know him are you walking with him do you have fellowship with him are you a part of his kingdom what about you believer are you are you living with unconfessed sin in your life listen that if that is you i can tell you something that i know for sure will happen god will discipline you Either you repent and you return, or you continue to rebel, and eventually God will discipline you. And he will bring you back if you belong to him. He will do whatever to bring you back. And then finally, are you, are you walking in the Spirit? Are you walking in fellowship with him? Are you sharing him? Are you living him out in your daily lives?